Okay, so in this video, we will give a beautiful proof of the following limit, which is that the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of h over h is equal to 1, and a key fact is that h must be in radians. So if you think about this intuitively, as h gets closer and closer to 0, the ratio sine of h over h gets closer and closer to 1, which means that sine of h must get closer and closer to h, the closer, the closer h is to 0. So we can state this differently. So if h is very close to 0, then sine of h is very close to h. And by this statement, we imply that the closer h is to 0, the closer sine of h is to h. Now in our proof, we will assume h is positive and very small. The argument is exactly the same if h were to be negative. So the proof is of a geometric nature and it relies on the unit circle. So assume we have a circle centered about the origin of radius 1, which means that the point here where the circle cuts the x-axis is 1, and the point here where the circle cuts the y-axis is also 1. And inside the first quadrant, we will inscribe a right angle triangle where the angle at the base is equal to h. So h is a small positive angle in radians. And we will also construct an even larger triangle by extending the hypotenuse of the smaller triangle and extending how far until we reach the point where we can draw down the perpendicular from this point to the intercept of the circle and the x-axis. So where x is 1 and y is 0. And one other key fact, if you look at the smaller right triangle, is that its hypotenuse is the radius of the circle. But we have a circle of radius 1, and so the hypotenuse of our smaller right triangle is 1. Now we have two triangles. Let's figure out in each case the base and the height of the triangle in terms of h. So to save a bit of space, I'll use the letters a, b, c for the picture. So call, say, the base of the small triangle a, the height, call it b, and call c the height of the larger triangle. And now let's figure out a way to express a, b, c in terms of h. So let's start with a. Well, by definition, cos of h is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So it's a over 1, but a over 1 is a. Therefore, a is cos of h. By definition, sine of h is the opposite over the hypotenuse, but b over 1 is b, therefore b is sine of h. And by definition, tangent of h is the opposite over the adjacent, but what's interesting, if you look, the base, the adjacent side of the larger right triangle, is again the radius of the circle, so it's 1. So tangent of h is c over 1, therefore it is c. So c is tangent of h. And by definition, we can express tangent in terms of sine and cosine. So tan of h is simply sine of h over cosine of h. The question is now, what then? Well. We want to look at three separate regions in this picture and compare the area of all three regions. So let's start with the area of the smaller right triangle. Well, it is a right triangle, so the area is nothing but the base times the height over 2. The base is a, the height is b, so this will be ab over 2. This is the area of the small 
right triangle. What is the other region? Well, if we add a little bit, namely this part, then we have the area of a sector of the circle. And clearly this portion is larger than the single smaller right triangle, so we'll have an even bigger area than the area of the smaller right triangle. The question is, how do we find the area of this sector of the circle? And this is where you'll see why it is crucial that H be in radians. So, the only real question we have to ask ourselves is what fraction of the full circle is occupied by this sector? Well, if you think of it in terms of the full circle, so we have here a circle of radius 1, but the area of a circle is pi r squared, so the area of the full circle is pi times 1 squared, which of course is simply pi. So the full circle has area pi, and now we ask again, what fraction of the circle is occupied by this smaller portion, this sector of the circle? Well, let's view the circle in terms of its angular displacement. The full circle has a complete revolution of 2 pi radians. And out of the full 2 pi radians, the sector only covers h radians. So we have found the fraction occupied by this sector. It is h radians out of a total of 2 pi radians. This is the fraction occupied by the sector of the circle, and this fraction times the full area of the circle gives you the area of the sector of the circle. And of course we have an even larger area being the area of the larger right triangle. Now things are a lot simpler. We have the area of a triangle, base times the height over 2. The base is 1, the height is c, so all we have is c over 2. Let's simplify a bit, and then we'll replace a, b, and c in terms of h. Well, if we look here, 1 squared is 1, so we can get rid of this. Pi over pi cancels. And if you look, what's interesting is, every term in the inequalities is over 2. So we can multiply across by 2, and this will preserve the direction of each equality. But if you multiply by 2, this amounts to canceling the division by 2 in each case. So we can cancel the over 2, and now we're good to go. A is cos of h. B is sine of h. So this is AB, is smaller than, well, we're left here with quite simply H, which in turn is smaller than C, which is 10 of H, but we will, instead of taking 10 of H, we will take sine of H over cos of H. So now we have these two inequalities. We have captured h between these two expressions of h. And the question is now, what's our next move? Well, let's go back to our objective. And that is to show that when h is very small, sine of h over h is very close to 1. And as a matter of fact, the closer h is to 0, the closer the ratio is to 1. So we want the expression sine of h over h. Well, a key assumption here is that although h is small, we took h to be positive. This was one of our assumptions. So if h is positive, then looking at our picture, sine of h is positive, cos of h is positive. So every single term here is positive. So manipulating inequalities with positive terms, as we did with the over 2 multiplying by 2, we can multiply and divide an inequality by any positive number, and the inequality is preserved. So let's divide across by sine of h. Very small, but still positive. So if we divide across by sine of h, so divide this by sine of h, 
divide this by sine of h, and divide here so do times 1 over sine of h, then we can cancel quite a bit. Sine of h over h cancels, sine of h over h cancels, and what are we left with? We're left with cos of h is smaller than h over sine of h, which is also smaller than 1 over cos of h. And we're close but not quite. We were hoping to obtain, going back, sine of h over h. Now we have h over sine of h. We have the reciprocal. The question is, what happens to both inequalities if we flip these around? Well, if you're not sure, let's look at a very simple example. 2 is smaller than 3. So how will taking the reciprocal on both sides affect the inequality? Well, because 2 is less than 3, 1 over 2 is larger than 1 over 3. If you divide by something smaller, you get something bigger. So when you flip, when you take the reciprocal of each term, you will have to invert each inequality. So what we have is that 1 over cos of h, taking the reciprocal here, will be, this will be flipped, bigger than flipping this gives us sine of h over h, bigger than again, well the reciprocal of 1 over cos of h is simply cos of h. We have what we want now, the only thing is this looks a little funny, as the inequalities are reversed, let me just rewrite this in the proper order. This is less than this is less than this. So let me write this first, so cos of h is smaller than sine of h over h, which in turn is smaller than 1 over cos of h. Another question is, what then? Well, I claim that we are now ready to let h approach 0 and see what happens to both the smaller piece and the larger piece. So let's visualize this onto the real line. We know that cos of h is always smaller than 1. And this is clear from the picture, right? The base of our triangle is cos of h, so cos of h is always a little smaller than 1. And the same goes for sine of h, right? Is the height of our triangle always smaller than 1? So cos of h for any small positive h, if this is 1, is always a little smaller than 1, but always positive. And if you look, so suppose that it is, say, here. So we'll say that this piece is cos of h. And of course, if cos of h is positive but slightly less than 1, the reciprocal will be also positive but slightly bigger than 1. And now the only question is, what happens to cos of h when h goes to 0? And you can easily see this geometrically. Cos of h is the base of our triangle. As h shrinks to 0, the hypotenuse comes down, down, and down. And so this point gets closer and closer to this point. Therefore, the base of our triangle will extend to 1. So as h approaches 0, the base of our triangle, cos of h, will be approaching 1. But now think about this. If you now let h approach 0 and look at what happens to each piece of this inequality, right, so let h approach 0, then what happens? Well, cos of h approaches 1, so this piece will be approaching 1. Well, if cos of h approaches 1, 1 over cos of h will approach 
1 over 1, which also approaches 1. And I'll think about sine of h over h. It has nowhere else to go. It is always between these two expressions, and they are both, as h goes to 0, both cos of h and 1 over cos of h are getting closer and closer and closer to 1. But sine of h over h is between these two bounds, right? For any small positive h, sine of h over h is somewhere between cos of h and 1 over cos of h. And as both are going to 1, when h goes to 0, sine of h over h being in the middle has nowhere else to go, but it has to also converge to 1. And this is why the limit of sine of h over h as h approaches 0 is equal to 1. And the argument is exactly the same if h were negative, but of course the picture is flipped, reflected about the x-axis. But everything else is the same. And that's it.